Welcome to The Breakdown with Barack Obama and Becky, a weekly podcast that breaks down politics, policy, and current affairs. I'm Michael Brockler. And I'm Becky Sher. This is our first week of our new episode, Morning Launch, and we're excited for this week's episode, which is actually a two-part episode. We're in studio today for our second show with the DFL Debrief. But today, not only are we talking to Brian Evans and DFL Party Chairman Ken Martin, but we're also joined by MNB, MNGOP Chairman David Hand. We had the opportunity to sit down with the two chairs for an hour and a half and broke down the episode into two segments. You can listen to the first segment by heading over to the DFL Debrief. We break down a recap of the 2023 session and then get into the 2024 elections. In this episode, you'll hear us continue to break down our thoughts surrounding the 2024 election with a surprise emphasis on education. So if you haven't already, we welcome you to go listen to part one of this interview on the DFL Debrief. Otherwise, get ready to jump into part two right now. I do want to turn it back to Chairman Han. I know we've talked a lot about voters have a short memory span. We of of across across all all political ideologies. So Republicans not only have to remind voters um, policies that the Democrats and you know enacted, passed, or whether they're active or not right now, um, but also as we talked about, stand for for something as well. Um, So what do you you know? I know you're you know kind of. 2024 is right around the corner. What are Republicans doing? What are in conversations with candidates, elected? What are we going to be messaging to the voters? And and what do we hope to have further conversations about? Well, I think one thing, uh, certainly the House majority is a top concern for us as a party. And I think for the House caucus, certainly it is. And part of it is trying to remind voters what uh, what Democrats campaigned on in those swing districts and those districts that were carried very narrowly and to point out that they, in fact, did not deliver on what they promised. And and people, I think, are expecting to see better results in their school system. I think that they are expecting to see uh, uh, safer streets in, in parts of the state where we've got historic high crime rates. I think those are things that Republicans uh, and I think all citizens have expected to see our, our state governed itself in a, in a reasonable way, and they have not seen that. So I think a lot of what the Republicans are going to campaign on next year, especially as it focuses on the House, is here's what Democrats said during a, in a campaign. They wanted to govern reasonably. They wanted to uh, do things to reto- return this historic surplus, as you mentioned, which should imply – uh, if you've got that, that big surplus, that there should be some tax uh, relief coming. None of that happened. And I think there are a lot of Democrats who made statements on the campaign trail to point that out. I think Republicans are going to remind voters of that and say, this is what Republicans wanted to do uh, before the last election. Uh, they didn't prevail. Democrats did. And they did not deliver on the things that they campaigned on, especially in these very closely divided districts. Yeah. And I think that is going to be the key to the election of whether or not those uh, voters in very evenly divided districts are going to say, well, we want more of this sort of, I don't know if you want to call it bait and switch, but a certain amount of deception about we're going to campaign on one thing. And then when we get into office, we're going to deliver a very, very partisan and I would argue extreme agenda that has not been uh, not meeting the needs of the people in those areas. You know, one of the things that um, both parties obviously do is we are focused in on um, uh, drawing contrasts where we need to, right? So we will talk about the Republican Party, of course, but I think one of the reasons the DFL has been successful in recent years is because, and this goes to Becky's point earlier, we're giving people a sense of what we would do when we come into power and we don't just attack the Republicans. We do. We talk about the Republicans too. We do the contrast, but we try to give people a sense of what we're for too. And I think, you know, not to be prescriptive or here or give you any ideas, Chairman, but I think back in 94, I was working on a congressional race for a candidate down in Wichita, Kansas named Dan Glickman. And um, we lost that race and we lost the majority. First time in 40 years, we lost the majority in the U.S. House, as you remember. And if you remember that year, which ushered in Newt Gingrich as the speaker, one of the things that they really did successfully that year is they ran on something. It was a contract uh, for America, right? And it was a whole platform of what they would do when they were in power. And they very rarely mentioned Democrats on the campaign trail. They gave people a sense of what they were for, what they would do to help people's lives. And 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 it was that was the argument, right? And I, I just think that it, it's fine. Of course, you have to contrast yourself with Democrats, but... This goes back to what I've said in recent years. I, I I don't know what the Republican Party stands for because they don't talk about what they stand for. They're not putting ideas on the table. And when they're out campaigning, they're just campaigning against us. 
And, and I think that's part of the challenge, both nationally and in this state, because you're not giving voters, and I, when I say you, I'm not saying you, David, personally, right, right. but the Republican Party itself is not giving a, voters a sense of, 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 of the differences between the two parties on major issues and what you would do if you were in charge or what the Republicans would do if they were in charge. So, Well, I think to that point, I, I think there is a uh, a clear vision that I think most people in the state and certainly Republicans believe that when we talk about education, it and public education in particular, it exists to serve and to help families educate their kids. And so to, to have a system that seems to routinely uh, want to tell parents that uh, they're not needed in any meaningful discussion about what goes on in their kids' education to uh, I know Democrats accuse the Republicans of of wanting to, uh, I don't know, destroy the public education system, which we don't. But we also want to make sure that parents have meaningful voices in what their kids are learning in school. And we see routinely that this doesn't happen, that the, there's, there's a, a concerted effort, it seems, to try to say, well, uh, we educators, quote unquote, are the experts and you parents just need to leave us alone and let us do our job. Uh, that is a to me. That's a theme that that Democrats have made generally for years. That the system should run largely without the input of families and parents. I think that is a huge mistake, and I think that our education system, frankly, has suffered. So Republicans would like to see an education system where uh, parents have a much stronger and more meaningful voice in what goes on in the school class in the classrooms. Uh, I think related to the economy. Uh, uh, I hear a lot from ordinary people who want to be entrepreneurial, want to create their own business, want to uh, flourish, want to pursue that American dream, and, and they get continually frustrated by the level of of uh, regulatory and tax burdens that are put into place. I mean, maybe if you're a major corporation, you can deal with all these things. You've got huge uh, uh, divisions of attorneys and accountants, and you can handle all this stuff, and maybe you've got enough resources that you can overcome these things. But for a lot of people starting out, those things don't exist. So I think there is great concern on the part of ordinary ordinary Americans, ordinary citizens of this state, how do we have a, an economic system where uh, we have a chance to grow a business, start a business? Uh, people talk about, well, we've got lower inflation than other places in the country, but nevertheless, we have record high inflation compared to, you know, five, 10 years ago. And it, it look at energy prices, food prices, you hear this routinely from people, very, very frustrating. Uh, I was reading the other day about uh, young families who can't afford to buy a home. Uh, that uh, the way the mortgage rates have changed, and and the way that construction costs have gone up, and people are just ordinary people, ordinary working people cannot afford to buy a home. That's a huge problem. And I look at that and say, well, for all the stuff that Democrats say they're doing to help, and all the things that they're doing that they say are benefiting people. I think when you talk to ordinary young families trying to start out, all they're talking to me about and to us about is how challenging it is to try to just live their lives and, and educate their kids. And those are things that Republicans believe in. We believe that, that to the point that Becky made earlier, that in many cases, families and individuals can spend the money to the benefit of their families and their kids much better than government can. But it seems from the Democrat side, there's a continual effort to say, no, we don't trust families. We don't trust parents. Uh, we trust these government bureaucracies that we've created to do these things for people. And there's great mistrust of that. So I think if there's one thing that Demo Republicans would say is what we stand for is we want to see a return to uh, respect for ordinary people and the ability to govern their lives and make decisions about the things that are most important, their health care, their education, uh, their uh, economic opportunities. Those are things that I think are being crowded out of this marketplace by Democrat policies. I guess I sometimes think that that is, that those concerns are almost ways of, I don't know, like, dodging problems or ignoring problems to an extent. I mean, I think about the Republic, like, you know, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape. I mean, I think about the Republican alternative to paid family and medical leave, which was something like, you know, $50 million of tax credits that businesses could maybe use if they chose to give their employees paid leave. And, you know, if you're like a young family looking to, you know, relocate somewhere, I feel like you might want a state where you could actually take time to, you know, celebrate the birth of a child and, you know, bond with a new baby, things like that. And sometimes I think that uh, Republican solutions aren't really 
actual solutions that are actionable for people. You know, you can certainly put on a door card that you have a paid leave plan, but if it's, you know, some tax credits that businesses can choose to use if they decide it to, uh, but they can also choose to ignore. I just don't think that's necessarily as compelling as, look, you know what, everyone's going to chip in a little bit, but that means that this system is available to everyone if you need to rely on it. Uh, and so I don't know, like, I guess sometimes I think that, uh, I totally understand concerns about red tape, bureaucracy, things like that. But at the same time, you know, government can be a solution for these larger problems uh, if, you know, private sector is not able to or uh, not willing to step up. And I, you know, I think there are small businesses that would like to provide paid leave but simply can't afford it. And the DFL bill that passed is a way that they can do so without, you know, sometimes like breaking the bottom line. Let me let me just say, though, I mean, in, David, you and I, we do a lot of speeches together, which right. I really appreciate to uh, high school and, uh, and uh, colleges and other, uh, you know, chambers, et cetera. Um, and so we, we've had these debates before and you've heard this, let me say this before, but my dad was a Republican and uh, he used to say there was three roles for government in people in, in people's lives. It was public safety, public education and infrastructure. Nothing else. No social issues, nothing else. And we get into this large debate all the time because I happen to believe there should be a social safety net and, and protections for the most vulnerable in our society and that we should make sure no one's being left behind. Public education, they are walking away from supporting public education. As much as you say they support public education, the reality is when it comes time to actually figuring out ways to um, fix our public education uh, 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 problems, the only solution Republicans have is to privatize education and to talk about school choice and, and taking money away from struggling schools and struggling students. When it comes to uh, public infrastructure, right? When it comes to infrastructure, the reality is as on almost every bonding bill in recent years, Republicans have voted against those critical infrastructure projects that are needed throughout the state. By the way, many of these communities represented by Republican legislators are not getting the funding they needed for for just core infrastructure projects to allow their communities to survive. And when it comes to public safety, when it comes to public safety, the Republicans say they care, yet they walked away from, on multiple occasions in recent years, um, uh, huge investments in uh, in public safety bills. And so it's I find it hard pressed to believe that this this sort of belief in government, which was just a limited government, even if you believe that it should be limited to just those three core services, that Republicans even believe in that anymore. And that's the struggle I think I have when I look at some of these Republicans serving in office anymore. Are there, is there anything we can agree on anymore that needs to be funded? Is it, We may differ on the exact funding levels, uh, what, what it means, what it should look like, is there any general agreement between the two parties on what government, even in its most limited capacity, should look like? And I think, I hope there is. Uh, I really do, David. I hope there is. But I would tell you it's one of the reasons why my dad and many people like him have left the Republican Party, because they don't believe they're delivering on even conservative principles or on a limited government that's focused on, on key services that they should be. To your point, uh, Chairman, I, I think that there are Republicans, uh, uh, there is broad agreement on let, let's make sure government works, let's make sure government works effectively. I think there's great skepticism that's been borne out over years and years and years, decades of practical experience that suggests that some of the things that Democrats claim government can do, they just can't do. It hasn't happened. Uh, I think there is broad agreement across the political spectrum that we want a very well-educated uh, citizenry. And it's fundamental to having a strong uh, democratic republic that you have to have educated people. But I think part of the frustration has been from Republican side is to see the massive amounts of funding that have been devoted to the public system and not see meaningful results, not to see improvement, not to see uh, stronger performance on, on basic skills, for example. Those are things that are frustrating. So we can agree that we want to make sure we have an educated citizenry but there's real questions being raised about whether the structure that we have today that is being 
uh, championed by Democrats and, and with very, very strong opposition. Democrats have historically opposed charter schools. They oppose public, uh, you know, uh, open That's enrollment. That's not true on charter schools. Well, I, I mean, know, we, we, we actually, the Democrats I, created charter right, schools here right. in Minnesota. You're, no, you're right. So. The, 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 the original author yes. of that bill was a Senate Democrat. But, yeah, Emma Rice got young. Yes, yes, and I know her and, mm -hmm. and I applaud her efforts. But in recent years, there's been a great deal of pushback saying that charter schools are a problem. They're taking resources, even though they are public schools. Correct. Um, but but looking at open enrollment, which was opposed, looking at PSEO, which was opposed, a lot of things that have happened over the years that eventually did get enacted were originally opposed by Democrats who said we can't do anything to, to quote, mess with the education structure. And all we're saying as Republicans is that we, we believe that you will have a better system, a better structure if you give opportunities for parents to have a more meaningful say in the choices or in the curriculum or in the uh, governance of their classrooms that in many cases are being kind of shut out. And that, that that's the difference. Not that there is a, uh, a desire to not pay taxes or to have a good education system. It's just that there is the evidence isn't there to say that what we're doing right now is delivering that education system. And I think the same can be uh, true about uh, uh, the economy and about uh, uh, public safety, there, there's real concern that as government has grown and grown and gotten more bureaucratically entrenched uh, and taken on more and more, quote, problems, but there hasn't been a lot of improvement on a lot of these things. Lots of money being spent, lots of bureaucracies being created, lots of jobs created in these bureaucracies. But when you look at uh, do the things actually get better? That's where people say, I don't see that. I'm not seeing that. Yeah, and that's here, what Republicans here, want to see. Here's the, here's the concern I have a little bit, though. So the Republicans talk about public safety. The governor puts a $500 million public safety bill on the table, uh, not this last session, the session before, and the Republicans walked away from it. So it, it, it becomes hard, even for me as a partisan, to believe that the Republicans are sincere about supporting law enforcement when they're walking away from one of the largest funding proposals that our state's ever put forward. Bonding, you know, Pete Stauber is a good example of this. He votes against the infrastructure bill, the largest infrastructure bill in our nation's history, and then he runs around the 8th Congressional District showing up at ribbon-cutting ceremonies, taking credit for something he voted against. And Republicans in the state legislature are doing the same thing right now, going back to their communities and saying, oh, well, I'm glad you got your wastewater treatment plant now, and showing up at ribbon-cutting ceremonies when they voted against the bonding bill. My point is... is you can't say you believe in this stuff, and then when it comes time to actually supporting law enforcement in the legislature, you vote no. When it comes time to supporting your own district, you vote against them, and then you show up and say, aren't you glad we delivered on this? The only reason, let's be very clear, the only reason there is more money for police departments in this state is because the DFL put forward a public safety bill that is investing in our uh, our law enforcement communities. The only reason that we have a bonding bill, a record bonding bill that's investing in much needed infrastructure throughout this state that's helping communities survive, small towns survive, is because DFLers delivered. And this, is the, this will be the debate because in the end, in the end, you have to defend, not you, David, but the Republicans have to defend why they voted against these projects. Why did they vote against the bonding bill, for instance? Well, there are, as you know, uh, in Minnesota, any bonding bill takes a supermajority. Yep. So the fact is that bonding bills in Minnesota get passed by Republicans and Democrats every time. I can't remember the last time there was a supermajority in both uh, House and Senate that didn't uh, didn't force a, 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 a both Republicans and Democrats to agree. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody agrees with every provision in a bonding bill. That's one of the things bonding bill committees try to do right. is design a bill that are going to bring enough people to they get that supermajority. So it's very possible that there are things in a bonding bill that a legislator supported, but many things that they didn't support. And it's always a question of judgment. Do I vote for the whole thing and take the bad with the good or do I not? Mm -hmm. And that's a judgment call every, legislature, every legislator has to make. But I don't think it's fair to say, well, Republicans were opposed to the bonding bill because they Without their votes, it wouldn't have passed at all. 
So they did work with Democrats to pass a bonding bill. It was probably not the same bonding bill that Republicans would have put together had they been the majority. And if that were the case, there'd have been a lot of Democrats who voted against it because that's the way these things work. You put together these large bills and you have to, by virtue of that, include many things that are not going to be broadly supported by everybody. So I don't think it, that the criticism is, is legitimate to say, well, Republicans don't want to invest in infrastructure. But I do think that there are many cases in, in those infrastructure bills where there are questions about, well, is this really a state priority? You know, the, the state uh, constitution requires uh, these projects to have broad state uh, impact. And in many cases, they're very, very local projects. I think that is, a, in many cases, what drives some of this uh, disagreement about what goes into bonding bill. But I think uh, uh, just the fact that you have legislators who vote against that doesn't mean that Republicans, as a rule, uh, don't believe in investing in infrastructure. But we can and do question some of the priorities and some of the choices that are made. So I, I think uh, uh, going forward, in my opinion, there is a broad agreement both Republicans and Democrats have. We want to see a better education system. We're just not convinced that what we've seen over the last 20, 30 years as evidence of how Democrats want to conduct public education, that's working very well. We'd like to see better results. We'd like to see it done more effectively. We'd like to see parents have a larger role. Uh, we think on the economy. We'd like to see less red tape, if you will, less regulation, uh, more incentives or more uh, openness. We believe in a, in a market economy. And I know Democrats say they do, but uh, they're very unwilling in many cases to let that marketplace work. And, and uh, what a marketplace means is that things are not done the same way everywhere. It's not one size fits all. And there's great frustration with people when they have to live in a system where everything is here is the solution, whether it's health care or whether it's education or whether it's some kind of uh, economic structure. There's only one choice. and It's the one that we give you. I think people want to see a marketplace of ideas and have that translate into their lives. And that, that's the ba major difference, I think, between Republicans' idea of governance and, and what Democrats do. Yeah. You know, during the on a recent episode of the the podcast, we had Karen Halsey on. She was the chair of the she's the Republican lead on the Capital Investment Committee, and and she spoke to about you know concerns that she had about the size and scope of the bonding bill. And when she raised objections with fellow members of the committee, the chair of the the bonding committee, Sandy Pappas, removed all the Republican projects out of it. And so that's a situation where I think we get into where Republicans have a different perspective and view about stuff. And in, in that particular instance. Senator Housley articulated that she thought it was punitive that all of the Republican bonding packages get removed out for a period of time uh, as that bill proceeds because they're not lockstep in in going along with what the majority wants. And, and that's an example, I think, of something that we've talked about before is in some ways, I think, kind of the heavy handedness of this past session. And so to echo what Chairman Hand said, but also also a little bit, you know, back to you, you the story that you've, you're discussing about your father uh, the role of the, the the party sometimes I think uh, precludes sometimes that that kind of that debate, and I think that was a good example this past session where I think Karen Housley I think was a legitimate you know broker and interested in there being a, a a reasonable capital investment bill, but when she pushes back, all of the Republican projects get stripped out for a temporary period of time, and we should kind of agree that that's not the way we should be going sometimes. Well, again, I'm not privy to those conversations. And I, I would agree with you 100% that if we're going to want people to bring ideas forward, we should hear them and we should give them uh, an opportunity, whether they're in the minority or not, to be heard uh, because they're trying to be a productive part of this solution and not the problem. I agree wholeheartedly with you, Michael, on that. So not knowing those conversations, I can't speak to that. But what, what I can say is that you cannot say that you're for uh, an infrastructure bill, right? Or for infrastructure and then vote against it and then go and take credit for it. It's disingenuous as Pete Stauber and other Republicans in the legislature are doing. You can't say you're for public education and then support stripping money and resources away from public schools to put them into private schools, right? Under the idea of, of, of more school choice and more uh, um, you know, choices for parents. They're, they are, they're mutually exclusive. They are mutually exclusive. You cannot say we, our Republican Party supports the public education system. It would be more, it would be better for me to actually have people say what they really believe in. No, we don't believe in this public education system because we believe there's, to your point, there's, there's a lot, it's not working, whatever, you know, there's waste, whatever you were saying about this and that parents need more um, uh, choices. 
that to me is more sincere than saying, oh, we believe in public education, but, or we believe in infrastructure, but mm -hmm. they, they don't believe in infrastructure because at the federal level and at the state level, as long as I've been in Minnesota, the Republican parties have always put forward a smaller bonding bill than the DFL. The Republican party, when they had options actually to vote on a bonding bill, Two legislative sessions in a row, they passed on actually bringing forward bonding bills when they were in the majorities in, in those chambers. My point to you, David, is, is that we cannot speak out of both sides of our mouth and say we believe in something, but then when it comes time to voting for it, we do something completely different. I think Minnesotans would believe folks more if they just say what they're going to do and then do it. And I think that's why DFLers keep winning because we tell people what we're going to do and then we do it. And we don't lie to them what we're going to do. We tell them, we do it. And then if they don't like it, they vote us out. They keep voting us in. So there must be a reason why. Real quick on, on the education thing, though, I think a, a fundamental difference of, of what you're saying versus what I personally believe in when it comes to that is the funding attached to each pupil, each Minnesota that is, is given to the schools belongs to the student, not to the school. So that it should be if a student chooses to go, whether that's through school choice, education savings accounts, whatever the means, chooses to go to a Catholic school, a charter school, a PAC school, whatever that might be, that funding is theirs to go with them where they want. So I think that that's not necessarily Republicans being against public schooling. It is about the choice. In my perspective, it is about the parental empowerment to allow them to have those options in front of them, not taking away from the school. Um, but from my understanding, how this was meant to be is funding belongs to the student, not to the to the to the school district or the school a, a, as a building. And so I think that's a little disingenuous to say that taking funding away or promoting school choice is anti public school. And, and I, I would argue and I, and I think that's that's a more honest answer than than what we've been hearing on this public education debate. I mean, if you want to have the debate about school choice and vouchers and privatization, that's fine. We can have that debate, but don't put it through the lens of this is about public education because it's not. The reality is is there's no doubt that as you strip resources out and allow more choice, if that's the word we want to use for for parents, the more resources stripped away from public schools, particularly failing public schools, right? They're not going to get any better with fewer resources. But if that were true, shouldn't they be getting better with more resources? Yeah. And the reality is, is a lot of them are. And, you know, the, the that... The, but the test yes, scores don't reflect There's that. still disparities. There's still disparities. And we still, particularly with, with uh, communities of color, the graduation rates aren't where they need to be. The test scores aren't where they need to be. But, you know, there's a, there are, it's a lot of good things happening in our schools as well. And, in you know, I just come back to the idea, if you're stripping resources away at a time when they need them the most, how does that help, right? So... I get it. I truly get it. I don't begrudge anyone who makes a choice in their life that they want to send their kids to private school, right? Uh, that's a decision they make. But it shouldn't hurt our public education system. And the reality is, is you know, if we want to talk about a free market system, this is where the free market fails. Because what about those parents who, who can't, for whatever reason, move their kids to a private school? They're left behind. And what happens to those folks who are left behind? A free market does not take care of the kids and, and, who are left behind. And, and what happens to the kids who are stuck in a failing school and can't afford to find another option, even though they may exist in the community they live in, but they don't have the resources to do it. And so they're stuck in a school where their child may be subject to violence in the playground and drug use and uh, inability to get a basic education, all those things. Uh, and I agree with you. That's why we need and, those and, schools to be better. Well, we I, more I think they do there. need to be better. But here, what I don't understand is why I, I think of public education as fundamentally education for the public, for everybody. And it isn't the same for everybody. There has to be a recognition that not one solution works for every student, for every family. But to say we're going to have that's a true. system that says geography determines what school you go to, good or bad or indifferent, that's what you have to go to, and we're going to fund it no matter how well or poorly it does. That's the system we have today. Why can't there be 
more choice within the so-called traditional public schools. I, I know of, for example, there's one school district that was in a district I represented, who the superintendent, well, I thought was very innovative. There were some uh, startup uh, private uh, schools in that community, and they were offering certain things to, to the community students, and, and some of his students from his uh, public system were being uh, attracted to that. What he did is he went to his school board and said, we've got to do some more things like that within our offerings. And they did. And within a matter of about, I don't know, five or eight years, a lot of those private startups and options that were there uh, failed because the students came back to the public system because you had an education leader that was saying, we need to have more choices. We need to have more options. We need to do more things to, to allow uh, the people in the community that we serve to, that their kids can have the choices that they need and want for their, for their future. I, I don't see a lot of that happening in the traditional structure. So again, I don't think choice precludes public education, but I think it does take a different uh, approach, a different idea of how you do that. And part of it, in our view, as Republicans, is that you have to listen to families. You have to listen to parents. You have to listen to what it is that makes a difference in their lives and then find ways to make that happen. And if the local uh, traditional public school isn't willing or able to do it, the answer isn't to say, well, too bad, you have to stay there anyway. The answer should be, well, then let's help find an answer for you. Or well, let's and, or let's help fund. Let's ha the, but part the, reality, of the answer can be and should be. We're investing in our public education system, the, so it's not just the and elites the and the people is, with money who can afford the a better is, choice. Over the last twenty years, at least, there has never been a year where public education funding from the state level has not increased. That has happened every year in the last twenty years, and that and, 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 and so that is a good thing in my well, yeah. opinion. But, but in your the, answer, though, was that you talked about those private schools that uh, ultimately failed, and I mean, what happened to those kids in those schools? And I mean, the, they went to back to the public school because the public system in that district said we are going to offer the things that 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 private startup was trying to. The, the, the superintendent was saying we we don't want to lose more students out of our our traditional public system, and so what they did is they said let's offer them some things that these other places are offering and see if we can bring those students back. And they were successful. So I, I attribute that to the innovation of the leader of that district. But to me, it's an example of with, with uh, uh, incentive, uh, appropriate incentives for leadership in the public system. There are other schools that do that, but we yeah. have instead everything kind of driven by state level. We used to call these independent school districts. They're not so independent anymore. You know, the bulk of the funding, 70%, comes from the state's general fund, uh, curriculum expectations, regulations, demands. I mean, we used to have these arguments in the education committee all the time. How can we do all these things that are being mandated by this law when you've got only eight hours in the day to deal with students? Uh, I served on a school board. We had the same problem. We were getting mandates from the state that said, you have to do this, 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 this. And they said, how can we make that happen? Why can't we recognize that public systems can exist that offer great choices to families. Why does it have to be one size fits all? This is the problem I think that Republicans have with the way the public system is run. We mm -hmm. don't, we don't, we're not opposed to public education, but we think the structure that has been solidified and supported and maintained by Democrats over the last 20, 30 years isn't working. And there's no willingness on the part of Democrats to say, well, let's take a step back and see if we can make this work better. There are too many failing systems that are not willing, apparently, to do innovative things. We've well, got to figure that out. I know you guys want to move on from education. Let me just pause at this for a moment, and no one may have the information at their fingertips. I would ask you to look at Republican states that have completely moved to a school choice model and ask and and let me know if the children in that state are performing better, both on test scores, high school graduation rates, ACT, SAT, college graduates in the workforce. I would argue, and I'm pretty certain that I'm correct on this, that they are not performing better than Minnesota is on any of those uh, indicators. High school graduation rates, uh, ACT and SAT scores, uh, other testing scores, um, uh, proficiency scores, and then also uh, the number of graduates in the workforce, high school and college graduate work graduates in the workforce. I'm almost certain I'm correct on that. And while we can we can agree that there's challenges in Minnesota's education system, we should also acknowledge that Minnesota's education system is regarded as one of the best in the country, and it still is. And that's because we're making investments. And when there's challenges, we're not walking away from those challenges. We're trying to fix them. So we can move on because we've talked a lot about education. This is a difference between both parties for sure. And again, you know, I, 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 there's there's no 
there's no one solution on this, but the reality is, is we have to be able to have this conversation to your point earlier, Michael, and I would welcome the Republicans to bring a real plan forward that's not just, hey, just give parents the choice to, to send their kids to private schools. Help me figure out how we can fix schools like, you know, over on the north side of Minneapolis so kids aren't failing there. Help me figure out those types of pieces. And it's not just, hey, let the dollars follow these kids to wherever they want to go to school because not every parent's going to make that choice. I think we've got to have a larger conversation about this. If you don't like the more investment, then help us fix what's, what you think is wrong within the current structure. And you mentioned some of it, David. Maybe it's some of it giving it more flexibility to local school districts, right? And not as many mandates. Those are all part of the conversation. But to me, part of the conversation is not, hey, let's just go to school choice and give parents the option. Let's take money out of the system. And I'll tell you one idea that we had when I was in the Senate the last uh, few years I was there, we had uh, talked to the uh, uh, chairman of the Minneapolis School District School Board who was leaving out of frustration. And he gave an interview to, I can't remember the publication, and he said, it's ungovernable. And he talked about the massive size of the Minneapolis public school system and how uh, there was a number of levels of bureaucracy and how it was just impossible to really get anything done. And out of that that interview, and we went and met with the 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 former school board chair, and we came back and we wrote a bill, and we said, well, why don't we propose that the Minneapolis school district be divided up into eight smaller districts, mm -hmm. one centered around each of the high schools, mm -hmm. and, and reelect a whole new board and give them autonomy, uh, do away with as much regulatory stuff as we could conceivably do without impinging on you know health and safety regulation. And that was opposed. Mm. Just the idea itself was opposed, even though the idea was let's let's create a smaller district that could arguably more be more responsive to parents and families, that if they had a problem, they could go to that local district. But there was great, great resistance to say, well, we don't want to do that. We want to have this massive structure in Minneapolis that, again, and the facts don't lie, there, there, there's been a deterioration, a hemorrhaging of students from those systems because they are not serving the people that they're supposed to serve. And I don't think that right. we can say, well, let's just put more money into it and that'll fix it. There's no evidence that that works. Well, but, I, I think you're, one thing you're on to is that it's, it, it's not just about investment. There's a lot more that needs to be considered. And maybe, you know, ideas like that are things that need to be put back on the table, right? Um, but the point is, is that, you know, it's, it, you can't solve every problem with just more investment for sure. But one thing's certain, you're not going to, um, if you start stripping away resources, things aren't going to be better either. So you got to find that balance here, David. I don't know what it looks like. Well, I, I haven't I'm not seen a any chipping expert, away of uh, resources. That's one thing I haven't seen is chipping away every yeah. Well, I do think it's fair to say that if you look at, <clears throat> especially some of the racial disparities in schools, there are a lot of probably causes for those that, you know, are outside of the school system. And I guess I don't see a lot of interest in rep from Republicans in doing some of the work to help, uh, you know, correct some of the factors, some of the like legacies of systemic racism and bias in our society in order to help, you know, solve some of those disparities. It's going to be a long process, but I don't really see Republicans doing much more than pointing to those disparities and saying, see, look, our public school system isn't really working when it is often a kind of much larger issue that uh, Republicans don't really seem to be very engaged in. And they seem more interested in kind of playing off regions against one another in the state rather than actually working to, you know, find solutions that help like lift folks out of poverty, that help like bring people together, that help create wealth, generational wealth in communities that have lacked it for so long. I would say this. I mean, I don't think that's true altogether, Ryan, that no Republican believes that. But I would say that there are some good examples of what you're talking about. So I remember when my kids were really little, um, uh, early childhood education teacher said, guess what? Your kids are going to hear 25 million more words by the time they go to kindergarten than some kids of color. And that really st st stuck with me for a whole host of reasons, because, you know, we're reading to our kids, we're there, we're present, we're, you know, they're in programs that, where they're at daycare and they can, you know, they're being read to. All of these pieces, right, that made me realize that my kids have a privilege that other kids don't. In addition, you know, there's no doubt that um, when kids get to school and they're hungry, 
and they're malnourished, they're not ready to learn. Their brains aren't ready to learn. And so when we pass the um, school lunch um, bill this year and Republicans objected to it, you know, when we talk about education, to Brian's point, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just the, you know, what's happening in the classroom, right? And there's other pieces of this that are impacting a child's ability to learn. And so we have to look at this more holistically. And and I, I don't think, and I think Republicans are, I mean, to be fair, I don't think, um, you know, this question of choice is, is a whole different debate. Um, I don't believe that Republicans or Democrats want to see any child fail, right? We just have different thoughts about um, how to best help them succeed. I will say, um, just to move on, because I know Becky's like ready to <laughs> move on here. Um, one thing in the 1970s, the Minnesota, the first Minnesota miracle was Republicans and Democrats who came together to say that we will make our education system the best. And core to that was whether you lived in, you know, Worthington or you lived in Apple Valley, that you would be entitled to the same type of education, right? Um, that every kid, wherever they lived in this state, uh, wherever, whatever their background, their socioeconomic level, that they were entitled to the same opportunities to succeed. And that wasn't just Democrats who believed that, that were Republicans. And I believe that that that's something we both still agree on. And whether or not it's through public education or private education, we both we all believe that every child in this state should have the same opportunity to succeed. And I think we can agree on that. There's deep disagreements on how to do that, and that's the way it should be, right? But this is something David and I were talking about the other day because there are still some core values that unite people across the partisan divide. And I don't, I don't buy that Republicans want children to fail. Um, I do believe that um, there are ways, I believe strongly that there are ways we can ensure that kids succeed. They might be different than, than David's, but I don't believe that Republicans generally want to see kids fail in this state. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm glad to hear that because I, I think you're, you're correct. Republicans want to see uh, the next generation prosper and have the same opportunities that uh, we hope for all of our kids. But I, I think there has been, on the Republican side, uh, an erosion of confidence that maybe existed at one point 40, 50 years ago that somehow uh, putting together these uh, massive programs of spending to try to improve uh, social ills, but there hasn't been much evidence that those social ills have gotten better. Uh, you probably are familiar with the Moynihan report that was written back in the 60s by a, a member of a Democrat to president's uh, cabinet and was very, very critical of the erosion of the family and uh, was uh, in crisis at that time. And when you look at the statistics today, those factors that were troubling to Patrick Moynihan back in the 60s have just become over the last uh, 50 years, much, much, much worse, even though there has been massive investment, massive attempts to create these programs that are were supposed to address those ills. So I think that there is a good reason to have skepticism, to say, well, big government, expensive government, massive government, one-size-fits-all government, whatever adjective you want to use, there's not a lot of confidence that that works. And why not empower families? Why not empower parents? Why not empower individuals to a larger degree than what we've seen in the last 50 years? Give them more scope. Uh, give them more opportunity. Uh, instead of trying to say, well, we can manage this, we can fix it, we've got a we've got a plan, we've got a plan, and all we have to do is make sure everybody follows it. That hasn't worked. And Republicans want to see a little more freedom, if you want to call it that, but a little more uh, ability for people to make decisions, again, about the things that are most important to them, their I, kids, well, their well, It often and, feels like leaving people to fend for themselves, right. you know, like empower individuals. Well, if you are like living in a low wealth community that has been disinvested in for decades and you're then told all right well go for it go empower yourselves you know like we're you, you are like if you don't make a lot of money you're probably not paying a lot of taxes and so if you're like if you get it like a <laughs> a tax cut does not really do much for someone who is you know not paying much in taxes because they fall like well below the poverty line so i guess i just I understand that skepticism, but I don't know what it is replaced with. Like one can't legislate 
a lot to do with, you know, family structure and things like that, that you brought up. And so short of social safety net program, short of support for folks who are struggling, like I don't necessarily, you know, letting folks empower themselves. Like, I don't know what that actually practically looks like for, you know, people who are struggling for people who have suffered from a lack of like investment who have been, you know, hurt by things like redlining and the effects of that. I just, I, it sounds nice, but when it actually is practically implemented, I think that means deep cuts to programs that a lot of folks rely on. And that would be deeply painful for uh, a lot, a lot of people. Uh, two things that I wanted to bring up. One, um, going back uh, now, I don't want to disrupt this. It's been an awesome <laughs> conversation, but uh, Chair Martin, your point, um, and, and I'll tweet this out afterwards, um, but with the nation's report card that did come out at the end of 2022, it actually did show that Minnesota non-public schools are performing better than public schools, and in particular as a nation as a whole, that if Catholic schools were a state, they would be the best performing state in the nation. So so um, there is some evidence of showing of that. But that's, that wasn't the point I was raising about n our non-public schools versus public schools. I was saying as a whole, our education system, the states that, red states that have gone to a, situ a situation where they're providing all the school choice with tax dollars following the students, those students aren't performing better. That's my point. I'm Catholic. So I, I support our Catholic schools for a whole host of reasons. Uh, they, they exist, and I'm glad that uh, that people have the option to send their kids there, right, uh, and and do. But but that's not the point to me. The point to me is this, right, is that on the whole, our public education system in Minnesota is in, in our education system overall in this state is doing significantly better than states that have gone to the model that some Republicans want to go to, which is a school choice and voucher model. Those states, it doesn't work. What it leaves is hollowed out public institutions that are leaving kids behind. And there, it, there's plenty of studies on that. And if you can find any state that has gone to a school choice or voucher model that's education system is ranked higher than me, please let me know. Not by me, but by us, Minnesota. Right. The, the question is not whether or not private schools in Minnesota are doing better than public schools. I'm sure they are. Right. The questions are, are public schools on the whole doing better than other schools throughout the nation? And the answer is yes. That's the question for me. We should be proud of the fact that we have a world class education system. And while there are challenges with it, for sure, the answer is not to go to a voucher or school choice model, because in those states, it hasn't improved the quality of education for any of those children. So why would we want to go to that model? But doesn't that, to Brian's point of saying, you know, some of these, because it is largely, you know, people, uh, families of color in the Twin Cities that don't have those choices. They don't have the means to send their children to schools. So shouldn't we give them, I mean, isn't this an education school savings account or school choice model that would allow them to have that choice? Because the families out in Minnetonka and Wyzetta, they, they have the means. They can, you know, just take it out of their savings or, or write those checks right? So shouldn't we be able to give families of color a choice to have those opportunities? I don't think so. Um, it's not about giving them a choice or not. It's about, at the end of the day, for me, it's about recognizing that the schools that they are in, if they're failing those kids, we need to figure out why they're failing those kids. And we need to make sure those schools are better so they're not failing those kids. Because stripping out resources is just going to make sure that those schools continue to fail. And there will be kids who are stuck in those schools who then we've just left behind. So the answer is not to just say, well, let's let people go to private schools and have the choice to. What at the root of the issue here is contributing to a school failing our children. And how can we fix that? It may not be more resources, right, to David's point, but I can guarantee you it's not going to be stripping resources out, right? Maybe there's some ways to allow more flexibility for those schools to be more creative and do different things, right? Maybe it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it's definitely not taking resources out by allowing kids, the dollars to follow kids to private schools. That's my point, right? Like, if we agree that there are schools that are failing, let's fix the failing schools and not just hollow them out. That's my argument. Well, so, and well, the legislature it, just passed a bill, the READ Act. It was part of the the like larger education bill that right. invests heavily in proven uh, like methods of teaching kids to read and updating curricula and teacher training and things like that. And so, 
I don't think this is a case where nothing is being done. I think it's a case where, you know, folks are looking at the problem. Folks are trying to find solutions that work broadly and trying to implement those. Well, here, and here's the, the trouble I have with, uh, Chairman, your, your argument about this is that there are failing public schools. We all know that. And the answer seems to be, well, we can't let any one of those failing students out and pursue a different option until we fix the whole system. So rather than have some, maybe not all, but not rather than have some of those students have an opportunity, we're going to say, no, you all have to stay in the failing system until we figure out all the things that make that system failing. This is what I don't understand. We're not going to say, we're not going to try to help anybody until we can get the whole thing figured out. And we have spent, at least in my recollection, 20 years in some cases, and it hasn't gotten better. And I'll tell you, as a parent, and I know you're a parent as well, but, you know, your kid only gets one shot at second grade. And if they're in a failing structure, they don't get, a, get that year back again. And if that parent in a, in a system that isn't working wants to pull their child out to go to a Catholic school or some other school, and the system says, no, uh, that's taking money away from the system. And if we take money away from the system, we can't make it better. So you're just going to have to stay in the failing system and too bad. We just haven't figured it out yet. That's what I don't understand why Democrats say that's the solution. We as Republicans say, no, let's try to give people opportunities to do the best for their kids. And that's where I, I, I think that you have to say uh, that's, what, that's what relying on individual judgment. Not every parent's going to make the right decisions. I get that. Not every parent's going to be wise and, you know, uh, uh, Socrates or whatever. But you have to allow more families some opportunity to choose what's right for their kid instead of well, we have to make the system the most important thing and defend that. And if kids get lost along the way, well, that's too bad. I, I just can't buy that, and I don't think Republicans can. Well, and I think I think pivoting to a system where, you know, schools are – there's this constant churn of, all right, well, you know, a bunch of students are being pulled out of this system, then that school closes, then those other kids need uh, somewhere else to go. That – to me, just and the kind of larger idea of not actually having this collective project that we all believe in and that we all try to build up, like to me, that seems chaotic. That seems like, you know, I remember uh, when I was in Wisconsin, we had like private voucher schools that would shut down during the middle of the year because uh, mismanagement, because of, you know, a whole host of issues. And then those kids would just be left with, you know, nowhere to go. It'd be a really tough situation. And I guess like, I don't think anyone's advocating for uh, like not trying to solve problems in our schools. I think people are advocating for a system where we all actually believe in it and try to solve those problems. And I guess I, like Republicans have been part of government for the past 20 years, well, like you, that you've brought up, you know, schools have not been uh, like Republicans uh, you're have right. been Republicans, at the table, and I guess in the last twenty years, you're right. Republicans have been in, in one or the other of the houses, the legislature, and the majority at times, not for very long, but have been. Mm -hmm. But we've never had a trifecta in the last twenty years, like uh, the Democrats just had last session, where they had the opportunity to do whatever policy reform, whatever structural reform that they had in mind, and we didn't see any of it. All we saw was a massive increase in funding. Well, but you're talking about Democrats not like campaigning, on, like not campaigning on the things that they actually governed on. Like, if Republicans had a trifecta, would you completely revamp our entire public education well, system in I, ways you haven't what, really? What I would do, what I would, like, I, what, I don't. What I would do, and and I hope that we see some of this happen in the election next year, is I hope that there is a robust debate about uh, what do we do to improve our education system. I don't think it's satisfactory to say. Uh, let's all acknowledge the systems haven't been great. We haven't really made much progress. In fact, I saw the NAEP scores that Minnesota is in the lower half of the NAEP scores. So we're not in the not the upper echelon anymore as far as those scores are concerned. But we are in the upper echelon when it comes to funding. And so I think that we, we should acknowledge, well, maybe there's some other ways to do this. And maybe we ought to take a look at how do we create uh, more options for families, especially families that don't have the resources. I, 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 when I was first in the legislature, I had a bill that was directed just at that. You had to be a, a family with a, under a, th a certain threshold of income. And if you were there, then you had an opportunity to take advantage of a, it was a kind of a voucher structure. And that was, we did get a hearing. Uh, I thank Steve uh, 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 Murphy for that, but, but uh, we, uh, 
uh, didn't get it passed. But the point is there are ways to, to say, let's try to make sure that as many kids as possible have a good education opportunity. And it, it, to me, it's pretty evident that what we have right now isn't doing that. And there hasn't been a lot of uh, signs from the Democrat side that they are willing to do that. And I think Republicans, and I hope we campaign on this, we are willing to ask those hard questions. How do we do education more effectively? How do we get better results? How can we break this code of at least the last 20 years of increased funding and decreasing performance? That's unacceptable. It's I, an embarrassment to our state. I, I will just say, putting aside all of the conversation we just had, <laughs> that if the Republicans want to campaign on school choice and vouchers, I would welcome that. The Minnesotans do not support any erosion of their public education system that has been proven time and time again. This is a state that deeply values public education, David. And, and for years, Republicans and Democrats have delivered on that. If you want to go and the Republican Party wants to go down the road of having a debate on school choice and vouchers, we will not only win, we will expand our majority in the state house. I will guarantee you that. And that's not... I want to have a debate that has Democrats explaining yes. how we've had this structure in place for at least the last 20 years that have seen... Uh, worsening test scores, worsening results, and massively higher spending. How that is defensible? That's a different debate. No, it isn't. It's okay. the same story. But but let we can have that debate without the having the debate on school cho school choice and I'm vouchers. Just, I'm just I, saying that that, yeah. that that is the debate, and the question is, well, what are the Republican ideas? And re what we're saying is there ought to be some contemplation that we ought to be doing everything we can for every child. And if that means giving some parents' options that they don't currently have, we ought to at least contemplate that. Now, you can call that school choice or voucher. Whatever. There's a lot of different yep. ways you can provide for opportunities. But it doesn't make sense to say, well, we're stuck in this paradigm that can't change. We can't, we can't uh, decrease funding. We have to increase it every year. We can't make the test scores get any better. We can't manage classrooms any better. We can't. And if you're stuck as a, as a family with kids in a school that isn't working and graduation rates are less than 50% or whatever it is, too bad. That doesn't work. It's an embarrassment to our state, which I agree with you. We have had a reputation of being a state that is interested in education. I just think, and I think Republicans generally think, the system we have isn't living up to the expectations people have. And I agree with you. That, and that's, the debate Public, we, that's the debate we need to have, though, and is, is, okay, the system that we have is not correct. living up. That's correct. So let's fix the system. What are the Republican ideas to fix the system? The Republican ideas to fix the system can't be let's just create a whole new system. And, and, and if that's the debate, I really do truly believe, uh, Chairman, that we win on that debate because Minnesotans overall for years have not supported any erosion of public education in this state. And, and, and if it's a school choice and voucher conversation, the DFL will win on that. Well, now, good. if you have ideas to strengthen the education system, the public education system here, with ideas within the system to reform it, to create better opportunities, to make sure no one's failing, all of that, I think that's a worthy debate and one that should be had, frankly, by both parties should be bringing their ideas forward. But I'm just telling you, I, I know... <laughs> politics. I know this state. You do as well. There is no support for school choice or vouchers in this state. Very limited. Well, let's agree <laughs> to, to have, <laughs> no, let's have it. Let's agree to have that conversation and, and further debates in this type of environment, if we can. I think that sure. we've done, I think this has been remarkable and I want to be <laughs> sensitive to everybody's time, but I just want to say to you that if you would have told me 15 years ago, I'd be sitting in a room with the with great staff and the chairs of the two major parties and listening to this type of debate. I would have told you what had been possible. I also would have never believed that I would have kept my mouth as shut as long as I have. <laughs> and I don't think you would agree, but I just want to say to you that this is as Minnesotan as it gets. And, and Chairman Han and Chairman Martin and to the staff, and Brian and, and Becky uh, and, and people that are here, and, and Anna and others that are here in the room, I just want to thank you guys for doing this. It's important that we have these type of discussions. And for the chair of the two major parties to come in and have a discussion and for Republicans and Democrats to work in a collaborative way, like this is exactly what needs to happen in Minnesota. And I just want to thank you, everyone in this room, for letting me be a part of the experience and, and helping promote it and just the discussion. It was just really inspiring to hear this type of discussion. And I hope that we can agree as Becky and I always say on our podcast, we hope you guys will come back for a second or a third interview. And I hope it would be good if we could do more of these type of discussions. But this was incredibly remarkable 
but I would we'll just have the opportunity to experience. I just want to say to everyone here on a personal and professional level, it meant so much to be in the room while it was going on. And thank you guys all. Yep. Glad to be here. Thanks yeah, for inviting Appreciate it. Very glad to be here. Let me let me just say one thing that David and I both agree on. <laughs> oh boy. We agree on a lot of things, but one thing we agree on is it's, it's important to um, get back to civility in politics. And we can have uh, fierce debates without being disagreeable. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We don't dislike each other. I think at the end of the day, um, that's what's needed in politics right now. People with different ideas um, are not bad people, and we need to make sure that they're heard and that they're part of the conversation. And we're both committed to that. David and I are, um, and you know, we all we have different ideas. You could tell in this last debate, right? But we're both also Minnesotans. We're Americans. Our democracy really, truly. Um, relies on a competition of ideas between these two major parties. And we need to get back to that in this state where we're talking about issues. We're not demonizing people or personalizing this. Uh, we're not generalizing. We're understanding that people have differences of opinion and it doesn't make them bad people for sharing those. So thank you for having us on. Appreciate yep. it. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, you know, Ditto to what Michael said. I think this is exciting, exactly what we're hoping to do here. You know, second round with the DFLG brief. Um, I can't say that I predicted that so much of the day was going to be spent on education, I but uh, <laughs> I will take it. And and hey, we didn't even get to some of the topics on our on our agenda. So looks like another round is is due. <laughs> we're going to have a lot to discuss post twenty twenty four session and heading into uh, next year's election. And I I mean, especially we didn't even talk presidential. So oh. save that for another day and I appreciate the time and, and look forward to future conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are no longer doing the food fight for the foreseeable future, although we might dip back into the subject. We are doing fantasy football pick'em league. And this is our first Monday where we're going to analyze the picks from the weekend. Now, there's still one game to play. It won't matter for you, um, but we still have one game to play. So what we're going to do is we release these episodes on, on Tuesday now. We're moving from Thursday to Tuesday. So when you're, you're listening to this, this will be part of our Tuesday episode that on the tail end of the bonus episode that we did with the, or the, the crossover episode, excuse me, that we did with the DFL uh, with Chairman Han and Chairman Martin. That was just a great conversation. Unfortunately, though, this section, we're going to have to talk about fantasy football in your pick em league. Now, Becky, um, you came in with a lot of swagger. You came in. If I may just set the table fairly for people, you came in with a lot of swagger. You came in with a lot of gusto. And why don't you just tally where you are right now? So, you know, I'm I'm not doing too hot. Here's the deal. I have a disclaimer with this, though. So when I go into my app, I do this in if a work league as well, and we do five picks every week. And those five picks are the ones you you get scored on, right? So I went into my league here. I just confirmed that it still says it. And it says out of six picks. So it says, so so I made six picks. Well, apparently, that's not valid. You made all the picks. So how did my app, I mean, is this a blonde thing? Is this a, what is, what is my issue here? Because I only made six picks. And you picked for all of the, the games. And so psh, I, I picked poorly. Sure, we'll come back to that. But man, I gotta figure this app out. Yeah, I mean, you, a minimum of six picks. It's just a minimum of six picks. Minimum of six picks. Why would it say like six out of six picks selected? I, I thought I was done. I thought I did my job. Well, even of the job you did, you didn't do it very well. Yeah. Operator error aside, man. I mean, first off, I will say I am I am proud of everyone in our league so far that did pick the Minnesota Vikings. And I, uh, disclaimer on this is that Michael is decked out here in Vikings gear, Vikings hat, Vikings shirt, represent. But man, that Vikings game. That was tough. Was um, you also, so here's the flaw I see in your pick. Oh yeah. You're Green Bay loyalist. Yeah. But did, did I get that pick right? Um, you did. did not. You did. I did. You did not. Oh, I did not get it. Oh, I was right. I did not get it yeah, right. You picked the bears. I picked the bears. Yeah. So um, sure. you got I'm it right. So of the picks that you, so you picked, so I, got two, I got two of my six, right? You mistakenly picked Kansas city. Yeah. So, so did you. 
Uh, we're just talking about your picks right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, I mean, this is fun. Uh, Spencer Career's in the lead. He is rocking he it. Is, he is currently leading leading the division uh, of our, our one week. Now, um, this is a public pick and league. You can do it. Um, I'm going to adjust the user error aside. Um, plenty of time left for you to make 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 up ground. Um, we are going to do, I'm going to adjust the minimum number of le- weeks that you have to participate in order to win so we can get people uh, to join in later. It is interesting. Everyone picked, of the people that picked, uh, in the Vikings Tampa Bay game, everyone lost. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, it was a loyalists. That's great. Um, we'll see how long into the season that lasts. If uh, sometimes you just want the point and you you, you see the writing on the walls and the bikes, man. You the the Packers game was late last night. Uh, afternoon three three. Like, did you? What was it? Full regalia at your house. So I, I let the husband for the first one have a, a little bit of time in the basement to watch the game by himself and then brought the baby and puppy down and we and we played. But he was he was into it, man. It was the reason why we had to tape our bonus episode later because I couldn't I couldn't saddle him with the child uh during the the first game. I decided I was gonna be a good wife and let him actually enjoy the game. That's very kind of you. And yeah. Green Bay won. It, they did. My kindness also probably is going to fade as the season goes on um, in that capacity, but we'll give them a week. That's good. That's n- nice <laughs> to get that on the record. Well, this is a fun way in which to, I mean, we're going from talking about your bad food takes and now talking about your bad football takes. It appears. Well, I mean, we have plenty of time. We got plenty of time. We'll make sure those adjustments count. Well, plenty of time for you to make up ground here. Uh, I'm but, do it. I just this isn't like my hustle, right? Like I, I just start out and I'm like, oh, I don't understand the rules. And then, then you're going to come in strong at the end. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I appreciate um, trying something new, doing something fun to engage our audience a bit. And I have no expectation that I'll be anywhere near the top when this is over. Now, I will say, I will say, uh, I do play in two additional leagues. I play in a guillotine league, which is everyone last. You're yep. basically done in one week if you don't. One team gets chopped every week. Uh, I made it through last night, which was big for the guillotine league. I don't have a very good success in the guillotine league, but in my family fantasy football league, uh, I dominated over one of my sisters. It wasn't even pretty. I had the Dallas defense and they had a really good game last night. And so it wasn't even close. And as I've noted before, when we were teasing up kind of this discussion, I'm a very good loser, but I'm a terrible winner. And there was a lot of offline trash talking, um, I have a number of uh, just obnoxious texts that I'll send my sisters, kind of baiting them during the day. I just love to do that. Uh, <laughs> after we do, after we make this, um, get finished this recording, I'm going to make some prank calls to my sister, just kind of rub it in, um, call her office, just kind of rub it in a little bit because that's the kind of little brother I am. Um, I hope they dish it right back to you. They do. Oh, they're very good at dishing <laughs> it back. But I got to take the opportunity while I have it. We want to thank you for listening to The Breakdown with Brad Corp and Becky. Before we go, show us some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the platform where you listen. You can also leave a review on our website at bbbreakpod.com. Again, our website is bbbreakpod.com, and then you can find us at Twitter at bbbreakpod. The Breakdown with Brad Corp and Becky will be returned next week. Have a great one. See ya.